Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, morning. I, morning. Uh, my name is Lasia. Uh, those of you who attend online classes might, might not have met me. Uh, I'm an instructor at the Academy of Real Estate Boston. And today I'm hosting uh, this Ask Me Anything session. So feel free to ask me anything. Uh, when you ask a question, make sure to unmute yourself or you can send your questions to chat. And I will see them. Good morning, Sonia. Good morning. Um, my name is Susan, and I have a question. Uh, uh, hey. um, I've been in the Academy of Real Estate in Boston for a number of years, but, but very extremely part time. And so because I work full time and I've gone through the bogs and I'm just starting cast. But actually, I have a question about painting. Um, I don't. I've seen many of Eric's um, um, demos and other demos of painting, and I don't quite understand the purpose of glazing, or um, I understand a little bit how you do glazing, but mm -hmm. I find it difficult going from the concept of drawing to painting, because it seems so very different. Um, well, it's uh it's not that different it's actually drawing with paint <laughs> more or less uh as far as glazing is concerned glazing is just one of the painting techniques you do not have to use it you can always paint opaquely uh that's not a problem but you can use glazing uh if you want to achieve uh more basically more saturated colors with transparent pigments some pigments uh, such as alizarin crimson or ultramarine are transparent and they look like more saturated, more chromatic when they are glazed that is applied in thin transparent layers over, uh, over lighter colors such as white or you can even use it for optical mixing. But that's, as I said, just one of the techniques that allows you to achieve this, uh, this effect. Um, I see there is a question from uh, Laurie. Uh, I've been watching the page which lists Garrett's lectures and I haven't seen his most recent lecture added to the list. Was it recorded? I assume it was. Maybe it just hasn't been added yet. His most recent lecture was on uh, Warm and Cool. Sorry, sorry, what was it on? What was the subject? Uh, on warm and cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm an online student and I watch things eagerly, but I couldn't watch it on Zoom this time. So I'm hoping it will have been recorded. Uh, usually they are recorded. Uh, maybe it just hasn't been edited yet. Okay. It's an interesting topic. It's one of the um, assignments in the figure part of the program. Anyone else? Any more questions? Well, since no one's saying anything, I'll keep going. <laughs> question. So, um, and this is a painting question, and I apologize uh -huh. to folks who don't paint yet or who don't do portraits, who don't care, or who don't care. Um, I've taken webinars with Eric and um, you know, the, the different, there's, you know, what the wipeout method once you've done your imprimatura and then you, mm -hmm. uh, so basically I was trying to, I wanted to, maximize the light uh shapes on the tip of the nose and you know where you would on a portrait and i don't know which is better is is it wiping out better to get to the the white of the original uh surface after i've toned it or is it better to what i what i ended up doing um was plopping on a layer of titanium white because i knew i had time for it to dry mm -hmm. um, because i figured the titanium white is a similar white anyway uh, to the original white of the surface and that um, it would look more 
it, I, I don't really want to do an impasto, but I kind of wanted to give the nose a little more substance. Mm -hmm. I figured an extra layer couldn't hurt. Um, what, what would you suggest in that situation? Um, <clears throat> okay, first of all, I have to make a confession. I do not use wipeouts or uh, tonal underpaintings uh, for my work. I prefer to start directly with color. Uh, but I, I guess I use the same logic and we are basically all taught to use pretty much the same logic. You have thinner shadows and thicker lights. So more layers of paints in the lights uh, to make them more substantial and almost like sculptured, even if these layers are very thin. So if I were to do this, I would be adding white in the lights. And I would probably even use a little bit of impasto for highlights later. Okay, thank you. I will do that. And I think that's pretty much how uh, old masters did it. They would uh, basically cake uh, lead white, which was uh, less saturated and more transparent than titanium. So they kind of had to do it uh, in the lights, layers and layers of white. So it was natural that lights were thicker than shadows with lots of layers of white. That makes sense. Um, okay, so we have a couple more questions in the chat. One is uh, from uh, Rajnesh. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, I completed my oil painting and applied retouch varnish after one month. Is it good for the painting? And I'm planning to do final varnish after nine months. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that I have I have never used retouch varnish. Uh, if you paint, I assume that if your paint is dry and the varnish does not have strong solvents, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but uh, and as far as revarnishing the painting, I would refer to the manufacturer's instructions because I don't know what painting you are uh, what varnish you are going to use and what solvent is the base for the varnish because varnish is basically a mixture of solvents and um, it can be natural resin or um, some kind of substitute uh, so just make sure that the solvent is not too strong to remove whatever paint is underneath or that the paint is already dry but I'm afraid I'm not the best person to ask this question because I haven't used retouch varnishes. Um, and frankly, the timing for varnishing, like you have to wait six months or you have to wait a year, uh, it's very arbitrary and approximate. It depends on a lot of factors, such as if you're using slow drying or fast drying pigments, uh, how thick your layer of paint is, because if you're using like this thick impasto, probably it's a good idea to wait longer. Uh, if your layers are thin, then you can probably uh, apply varnish sooner. Uh, also depends on the temperature, exposure to light, uh, humidity, and tons of other things. Um, I have been watching the paintings of Paul Gauguin. If one is following the current academic training, how could such a sensitivity be developed? I find it really hard not to try to be very accurate with colors and values and shapes. Uh, well, frankly, being accurate with colors, values and shapes is, is good. That's what we're trying to do. But... Um, if you're asking about uh, how to get, if I understand it correctly, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, uh, how to develop more freedom uh, and step aside from just trying to loyally copy what you see and be more expressive, if you will, um, then I would say just paint more. Paint more, see what works, uh, what looks good, what looks fun, and 
I guess at some point it will become natural for you to experiment and find something new. But basically it's it's based on experience. It's not like there is a course teaching you how to paint like again or how to find your own style voice. Right? Just paint and draw more. Sorry, I don't know any other recipe. I hope it answers your question. Um, next question is from uh, I have Alberta Mary. Uh, I have a question regarding studio lighting. Yes, yes. please don't ask the question. Okay. Thank you for um for this time. Anyway, um, I have um <clears throat> I have a really small space. Mm -hmm. It's but I have a a skylight that is facing north. And uh, to be honest, I, I really think the light coming into that from that skylight is quite nice. It doesn't seem to glare so much, mm -hmm. but I'm wrong about that. Um, so I guess if, in your experience, do you think that using a, a window for my, for my, um, for my easel and my, my work, and then maybe um, isolating a, a light around with a cine the cine paper there, um, and making like a spotlight on a on a um, on a still life is 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 a good plan. Or do you think I'm always going to have to keep you know adjusting because of the light that's coming from the window? Do I? What's your experience with with light and natural light versus another kind and everything else I said. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Uh, well, first of all, a disclaimer. Please keep in mind that whatever I say is not like the only right way to do it. Moreover, maybe it's not right. Yeah. But I I love natural light. I, uh, I have a lot of windows. Like in this room, I have, you can see it, I have windows on all um, on three sides actually uh, around me and my easel stands near the window and uh, the light is coming from the left so it's convenient for me to uh, to draw there um, and I I like it uh, now in the studio at the academy I do not have windows and I uh, I block um, I block light from the windows so mm -hmm. I only have artificial lighting uh, because it's more controllable. Natural light changes. That's the only uh, the only thing that is kind of inconvenient, and you do not have a lot of it in winter. Uh, for like once again, I I love the light. I like the quality of natural light. I love how it's uh, it's less tiring for the eyes, and it just looks nicer. Uh, Ideally, you should be using the same kind of lighting for your easel, palette, and the setup. Mm. So at the studio in the academy, at some point, I had three lamps with cinefoil, one for the setup, one for the easel, and one for my palette. Then I switched to two. I was just putting my palette in front of my easel. Uh, this way, you make sure that the colors are the same on your setup and your uh, painting because if you have um, if you have let's say neutral light for the setup and cooler light on your painting the colors may look different okay <laughs> so you want to make sure that you're using the same temperature um, okay do you have to I mean, maybe if you have a shadow box, you can get away with yeah, you have uh, neutral light for this setup, like, um, I don't know, 4000K, for example. I have a GM, GVM, Great Video Maker Light. It's on a stand. Mm -hmm. I have two of those, and um, it has a lot of, a lot of, you know, that has the right kind of, you know, Kelvins and all that. Okay. I just, I just want to make sure that, uh, yeah, yeah, I do have that. I do have that. What was your question? 
uh, 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 the the temperature of the light. Yes, it sounds like it's uh, it's neutral. So then I guess it, it should be fine. Okay, so I can use the window, and if it ch there's probably I'm just gonna have to adjust. I think that I will have to probably paint something and try try to um, get used to it. But I guess it's only gonna be experience that's gonna help me get through this um, this kind of, it's like a block, like, oh no, I don't have the right light. But I love the way the everything looks in here with that lit. I'll show it to you, it's, it's pretty, it's that light there and it's- it, um, It's nice. And yeah. daylight, daylight is- uh, it, This is my space. Better, it's, yeah, and uh, it's better for the eyes. I noticed that you get less tired with daylight than with electrical light. Okay. But uh, ask Eric, who is your instructor. I, yeah. I'm sure that he does uh, He does answer questions about the setup yeah, and tons of um, materials on how to set everything up. Uh, if he says, no, absolutely no, you should be using the same light for the easel and for the setup, then so yeah. be it. But me personally, if I had a chance to utilize daylight, I would definitely do it because I like what is not for the setup because you cannot control it, but at least for the easel or for your palette. Okay, tell me now. Um, did do you come out to the house? Um, I live in Gloucester. Would you mm -hmm. be willing to come out for a pay to check my space and give me some tips on uh, studio space? I I would be happy to do it, but uh, as I said, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a specialist, and I have a different studio situation in in my studio at the okay. academy. Eric said he could do that. Eric said he could do that, but I bet he's going to be interested in electric lights. But I j I thought it would be nice to um, if you I, I might ask again another time. I could ask any any questions, so I thought I'd ask that one. And um, definitely, it, definitely. I yeah. I hope it I hope it helps. Yeah. It, is anything uh don't be afraid to experiment uh, right. with lighting as well and if you like how everything looks in the daylight and how it works for you and how it as i said it probably will make your eyes less tired than electrical okay. light then then use it yeah i can't i don't even like the grocery store <laughs> with the light <laughs> so, so if, if you more enjoyable for you to yeah. pay then why not make it okay. more fun thank you uh but if you uh if you have any further questions um you can uh, you can find me on instagram uh okay. Sinkowski with an underscore and feel free to send me messages and uh ask fun. whatever okay thank you you're welcome um okay Let's see. Um, so, um, if your work is dried too much uh, to touch and the color is sunk and you have to display it in gallery, how will you do it? Um, there is a so-called um, thumbnail test. They say, well, first of all, if it's Paint it thinly, and uh, there is not a ton of extra oil added to it. And it's been at least a month. I would assume that it's it's okay. Uh, the thumbnail test is: you take your thumbnail, you press it against the paint, and then if you can. Uh, straighten the surface of the paint and uh, there will be no trace, it means that the painting is dry enough to varnish. So I would varnish it and hope for the best. Usually if there is there are no technical um, errors like breaking the effect of a lean rule or as I said, using too much oil, you should be fine. Uh, the only problem can occur if something is not dry and you need to remove the varnish at some point or someone else needs to remove the varnish at some point. For example, to clean the painting, like in 50 years, 
Um, but other than that, it shouldn't be just just varnish it and hope for the best. Or if it's wet, then probably it shouldn't be displayed in the gallery. Does it answer your question? Um, when painting, how do you, yes, okay, uh, I'm glad. When painting, how do you suggest the complexity of, for example, rocks or vegetation without representing each individual element? Um, I do not have a specific algorithm for suggesting the complexity of rocks. But uh, basically, I follow the same steps that uh, I've been taught at the academy. I start, um, I start with an abosh that is uh, colored under painting, which is not can be yes colored under painting, which is very simple. And at the same time, because it's so thin, uh, it already has texture. Um, and then I add another layer with more detail, but still thinking about masses of light and shadow. Maybe make this layer thin as well, uh, again, to add some texture. And then add more, another layer. And basically, after each layer, I ask myself, do I need to paint anything else, or is it enough? Uh, if it looks close enough, then I use other tools for um, for suggesting texture. It can be something as simple as, um, as I don't know, just a skewer, just scratching to show the texture, or the palette knife again to scratch, or maybe to like draw branches. Uh, with the palette knife to scratch all the paint. And after each step, so to say, uh, I'm trying to be very simple and I ask myself, is it enough? Do I absolutely have to add anything else? Or is it is it fine? But I'm trying to stay simple and uh, hope that it will look good. I know it's not a very, a very, um, in-depth answer, but that's pretty much how I do it. I try to stay simple and make as little as possible. <laughs> um, and I do not draw individual elements or do not paint individual elements. Think of masses, light, shadow, and just some texture. Um, I hope it answers. Um, and actually with textures and because vegetation or rocks, the the characteristic things about them are textures and like different different mark making. So just experiment with it, see, see what works. Um I studied at the Imperial uh, Imperial Academy of Arts for a month, and I was told not to use linseed oil because of oil color contain linseed oil. Is this method good for the painting? Like adding linseed oil uh, for some things, yes, uh, especially in the finishing. Uh, my rule of thumb is to not add anything to oil paints uh, unless I absolutely have to and trust the manufacturer that they know better how to make paints with everything that is needed for making paints, uh, and I do not need to add anything. Um, I can add a little bit of solvents in the uh, in the very first layer, uh, in primatura, and underpainting maybe, then nothing, and then I only add linseed oil if I glaze, uh, because you need to make the paints transparent um, and like, thinner uh, or for something that is called uh, couching that's uh, a technique that we use for blending uh, and that's still minimal amount of linseed oil and you do not have to do it 
Instead of linseed oil, you can use other oils. Uh, they all have different properties, different drying time, and um, different, different viscosity. Uh, Eric would probably have something more scientific to say, uh, to say about it. Um, so do you have to always add linseed oil? No, and it's probably not a good idea. Uh, if you need it for a specific technique and you know why you need it and you have uh, a decent idea of what you're doing, then why not? And by the way, uh, oil paints are not always made with linseed oil. Uh, I like paints, for example, that are made with safflower oil. And if you do add oil to the paint, uh, to the paint, then make sure it's uh, it's it's a drying oil. Like, do not add uh, semi-drying or non-drying oils to paint. So I hope it answers your question. Uh, Julie has a YouTube video about setting up your studio. Yes, yes, she does, and she. Uh, yeah, speaking about uh, studio lighting, she gives recommendations about what lights to use, what light bulbs, and where to buy them. And yes, it's all very, very detailed. Okay, uh, but... Mm -hmm. but as far as I know, Julie doesn't use uh, natural light. She yeah, I knew that, yeah. And I thought, I figured you did. I uh, yes, not 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 at the school. At the school, uh, no one uses natural light, and we just we do not really have a setup for using the light. But natural light. But here, I I like natural light. But mm -hmm. also, I I draw a lot, so my situation with the setup is a little easier. Mm -hmm. I do not always have to make sure that uh, I use the same lighting. Mm -hmm. But uh, I try to utilize the light as much as I can just because it's it looks nicer and it's better for my eyes. Yeah. Uh, will changing the captions to English mess with others need for Arabic? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, to uh, suggest you may adjust online and search for other oil paintings of similar things to what uh, I'm wanting to pay. I look for paintings where I like how they handle the problem and then use that as a guide without copying outright. Uh, that's, yes, that's, that's a great idea. And uh, we all definitely do that to some extent. Um, I... Uh, I uh, what I suggested is um, also based on my uh, not particularly vast plein air experience. It's uh, it's just a fun and extremely uncomfortable way to find out how much you can do with as little as possible because you are limited in time. So that's that's another way. I guess you can approach it from two sides. One is slow and relaxed research, looking at others' paintings and other, the other one is plein air, just seeing what happens, how you can make it work. Um, okay. When you add a new layer of paint on top of a lower layer, is that the same as glazing? Uh, how do you add layers without erasing what you did underneath? How do you refine what you did in the first or second layers or adding color to a grisaille? Um, okay, when you add a new layer of paint on top of a lower layer, it's not the same as glazing. Glazing is applying a transparent layer of usually a darker color on top of a dry lighter color. Uh, glazing is usually done with transparent or at least semi-transparent pigments, such as uh, alizarin crimson, ultramarine, um, burnt umber can be used for glazing as well. And basically, uh, uh, or, um, I don't know, cobalt blue or phthalos. 
whatever is transparent and dark enough on top of a lighter color. And it's a thin, uh, even layer so that you can see the layer underneath. And what it does, it allows the light to travel through the glaze, bounce off the layer underneath, lighter color, and uh, get basically back out, which creates uh, this effect of more saturated color. And it looks nice. Um, adding color to a grisaille can be done in the same fashion. And actually that's, uh, that's what painters did quite a lot, uh, especially when they didn't have tubes for paint because it was a more efficient and on top of creating this beautiful effect, it was a more efficient and economic way of using a paint. You use cheaper, uh, easier to mix pigments for a tonal underpainting, such as earth pigments uh, that were very cheap and lead white, which believe it or not used to be very cheap because they made it themselves and it was relatively easy to make, albeit not safe. And then they would try and mix as little color as possible using more expensive pigments such as ultramarine and dilute it with oil to create that transparent layer and apply it on top of grisaille. But the main goal was to basically save on paint and not mix too much paint because everything that is not used during the session is, is wasted. So that was the, uh, the practical side things apart from the beautiful effect of saturated color. Um, how do you add layers without erasing what you did underneath? Uh, you make sure that your layers are dry or at least dry to the touch. If whatever is the, you've been working on previously is dry to the touch, then you can safely add another layer on top of it um, to make sure that your, uh, to accelerate drying time, you can also think about what pigments you're using and use more fast drying pigments in your, in your beginning layers, such as uh, lead white and earth pigments and not use uh, slow drying pigments such as um, ivory black, ultramarine again, alizarin uh, metal pigments. But when it's dry to the touch, you can keep adding layers on top of it and it will not erase anything. How do you refine what you did on the first or second layers? Uh, I let them dry and then I uh, add things or repaint what needs to be repainted. Um, but that's, that's pretty much, that's the beauty of painting in layers. You can do technically as many layers as you like uh, as long as they do not have texture and they are thin enough. So you just let them dry and then add more and more and more. And you can use mediums such as additional oil for glazing as well. I hope it answers your question. You just need patience. Let it dry and then add more. Yes, thank you so much. Because <laughs> I'm trying to understand painting in why are you putting on all these layers and what is glazing? What does it mean? And then you mentioned earlier that um, you don't like to glaze all that much. So do you work more a la prima? Uh, we are at the school, we are all taught to paint in layers. Usually we have uh, the paintings have at least uh, three or four layers. The first one is imprimatura. That is basically toning your canvas and you can do it in different ways you can you can have an opaque imprimatura but the more traditional way is to make it very thin very light and you can use solvent for that layer you don't have to but you can then the next layer is some kind of underpainting uh usually we do uh we do an abosh which is a colored underpainting, but you can also do tonal underpainting. Imprimatura is not a color. I mean, you can use it as color if, you are, uh, if your planning is good enough and you know in advance uh, which 
areas of the paintings uh, of the painting are not going to be covered. Um, but other than that, your imprimatur is just uh, the very first layer that prevents paint from sinking in too much. Uh, and that allows you to get rid of the white of the, uh, of the surface, which makes it easier to adjust uh, values. So that's the main function of the imprimatur. Uh, and it also kind of sort of creates some color harmony, but it's not that important if you use uh, something neutral such as umber, burnt umber or uh, raw umber. Then a Bosch. A Bosch is basically very thin layer. You can use solvent, but you don't have to. It can be just thinly distributed paint. And it's very simple. You can think of it as basically a drawing or a map for your subsequent layers. Yeah, like you're showing your uh, adjusting your drawing and you're showing yourself, okay, this is going to be light, this is going to be shadow, this is going to be more or less roughly on average like yellow, this is going to be blue, this is going to be brown, and so on and so forth. And then you start applying paints opaquely. That's called first painting. First painting does not have to be done in one layer. Uh, but you apply paint opaquely, you make sure you do not get too much texture unless texture is what you are after. And you do not have to do everything in one layer. You can have first first painting, second first painting, third first painting, and so on and so forth. The idea is that it's opaque, you can add more and more details, and you do not blend, and you do not mix on the canvas. And you let the paint dry in between layers. And then the last layer, or one of the last layers, is blending or using special effects, so to say, such as glazing, where you add probably uh, oil or some other slow drying mediums. Uh, but you technically, you can do without any of the layers, uh, with the exception of first painting because you need to paint something. You can do without imprimatur, you can do without a Bosch, you can start directly like with opaque paint. Uh, you definitely do not need glazing or blending or anything. These are, as I said, special effects. Uh, and, but yeah, uh, I hope it gives you the, the overall idea. Yes, thank you very much. Very helpful. Oh, you're welcome. But you, you'll figure it out when when the time comes. Um, how do you lighten red color and still keep the chroma high without making it pink? That's where you use glazing. That's, uh, as I said, glazing keeps the colors uh, saturated. Uh, so you... <clears throat> paint something that is supposed to be a lighter version of red uh, white, and then you apply a red glaze on top of it. This way it doesn't, uh, you do not add white to the mixture. And at the same time, since the white is, uh, can still be seen underneath the uh, transparent layer of red paint, uh, it looks lighter and you keep the chroma. Uh, usually, uh, you can experiment with different colors. It's great if you have some kind of uh, transparent red. Uh, it can be a mixture of uh, cadmium red, which is not transparent, with alizarin, which is transparent. Or you can uh, opt for something more exotic, like, I don't know, viral red. Um, but basically it's glazing. Do you recommend using the transparent white some brands offer as an, as an alternative to lead white? Um, I love lead white and I love a specific brand of lead white. Uh, I use uh, Old Holland lead white. It costs an arm and a leg. 
but it's very nice to paint with. It's uh, it handles nicely. It works nicely in the mixtures. It's pretty saturated for lead white. Actually, it has a lot of pigment, so that's my preferred white. Uh, that's what I would recommend, but not because it's, again, it's the only right thing to use, but because I like it and I like the drying time, I like handling, I like consistency, and I've tested multiple whites and this is the one that I like most. Uh, it's the most comfortable one for me and since practically all mixtures that we use contain white to some extent, this is something that I uh, I'm prepared to pay more for, just to feel more comfortable and enjoy the process. <clears throat> when you do a sketch for a portrait in real person or from a photo, uh, do you have a certain value range, for example, the hair, lights, and shadow on the face and the background? Um, Yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, yes, I prefer to uh, I prefer to use the full the full value range. <clears throat> um, I usually reserve the darkest dark for uh, accents such as the darkest shadows, um, some I don't know bed bug lines. Uh, I can think about separate value ranges for hair and skin if a person has uh, dark hair, for example. Uh, and in this case, yes, I would think of everything on the face, including shadows, as being lighter than the hair. So I would think that, okay, values one, two, six, let's say, are for the face and values I don't know, four to nine are for the hair. But um, at the end of the day, I might use a uh, more compressed value range for the hair and more values, like darker values um, for, the, uh, for the face. So this way I'm not technically drawing what I see. I draw what I think is going to look better. Does it make sense? Like I invent the value range for the um, for something that I want to be more rendered and that I want to attract more attention to. And the rest can be like, or I can start with uh, something that is that I'm more interested in, like the face. Use full value range and then use whatever is left for the hair and clothes. I hope it makes sense. <clears throat> uh, could you share your approach to developing a new painting and what are the most challenging aspects of working with oil paints? Developing as in uh, coming up with an idea or uh, painting. If we're talking about the technical uh, technical sides of the side of things such as uh, like if I already have a setup and I just need to paint it sorry then it's pretty much the same approach that I'm sure um, Eric is teaching online. I start with a cartoon that is a preparatory drawing. Uh, I like pretty detailed cartoons, especially if there are small uh, small details or if it's if there is something complex, um, because it's more comfortable for me to draw in with a pencil than in paint. And then I transfer. Then I use all the stages that um, I mentioned earlier, and I uh, I paint and hope for the best. Uh, the most challenging aspects of working with oil paints. It's difficult. Um, 
I hmm. I guess the fact that it requires uh I mean drawing is easy because you just pick up a pencil and you start drawing. Uh oil painting requires a lot of preparation and um a lot of discipline and oftentimes planning in advance. So it's a much more uh, it's a much more complex process that requires more discipline. I guess that's that's the most difficult aspect, but it's also it's also fun. Um, so I I hope it answers your question. And as for developing an idea, that's that's a whole different uh, that's a whole different thing. And I don't think there is a. Uh, a one, just one answer to this question. Uh, can you explain the significance of color choices in your work and how they affect the viewer's perception? Um, significance of color choices in my, uh, I, I'm not sure how they affect the viewer's perception because that would probably be a question to viewers and not to me um significance of color choices i i like color i like chroma and my logic behind um uh, harmonizing colors is if you listen to um to garrett's lecture it's the harmony of warm and cool uh, warm and cool and complementary colors. So I don't think that, I don't believe that there is a certain right color and you can technically sneak any color in any, in any other color and it will still look harmonious. Like if you're painting a white object, it doesn't have to be like shades of gray with white and some, I don't know, black or amber. Uh, you can sneak in lemon and, I don't know, turquoise and it would still look good. I'm more interested in the relationship between warm and cool colors and complementary colors, um, such as red and green, uh, purple and yellow. And that's that's what I try to do in when I paint. Uh, so that's, I guess it's a very, even though I do try to match colors, to some extent it's, an, it's the same approach that um, impression is used. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm Monet, I'm very far from him, but um, that's that's um, some, if you are interested in this approach, that's uh, something that they used and um, that's where you can read about it. Uh, how has your painting style evolved over the years and what have been the major influences on that evolution? Uh, over the years implies that uh, there are years or dozens of years of experience, which I don't, <laughs> I don't have. Um, the main influence, uh, I guess, has been the training at the Academy of, uh, Academy of Real Estate. And in general, I think that I'm still, I'm still learning, I'm still exploring, I'm still experimenting. And I consider myself a confident, more or less confident uh, draftsman or draftswoman, draftsperson, uh, rather than a painter. So as far as drawing is concerned, there are certain uh, influences. There are artists that I like. Uh, that's basically, I look at their drawings and I think to myself, when I grow up, I want to be like, 
sergeant or whoever. Um, but that's that's mostly drawing. With drawing, I feel more confident. With painting, I'm still I'm still learning and trying to find out what works and what doesn't. Uh, how do you draw thin lines? Do you use oils or solvents to thin out and decrease the viscosity of the paint? Um, I use very thin brushes and uh, if I need to decrease the viscosity of the paint, I use a so-called drying oil. Um, I don't use a lot of it. I usually have uh, a few drops on the side of my palette. Um, the drying oil is, uh, it's made by uh, Rublov. It's uh, basically linseed oil uh, with, uh, with some additions or like they, they do something to it. I don't know the exact chemical process. I was horrible at chemistry at school. Um, but the idea is that it dries faster and it does not it does not affect drying time of the paint as much as if you were just adding pure linseed oil. I do not add solvents uh, because see about fat over lean. Uh, solvents or rather uh, slow drying over fast drying. So solvents are fast drying. So I wouldn't use solvents in like in the middle layer. Uh, but yeah, thin paint and if you need to, uh, I use drying oil. Basically anything uh, that wouldn't affect drying time too much. Um, you can also use uh, you can also use a flat brush something like this and you can like, shape the tip so that it would make a very thin line and that you can also use use that um, another option is uh, using I don't know a needle or something to move paint or scratch the surface um, Yes, so I hope it uh, answers the question. Uh, you mentioned that you especially like Old Holland's lead white. Are there any other oil paint colors, brands that you particularly like? Mm. Um, I'm not a... I'm not a paint brand uh, snob. I would use and try pretty much, uh, pretty much anything. I uh, I mostly use gambling just because I like um, I like the combination of quality and um, and price. Um, there are a couple of uh, tubes of um, natural pigments, uh, roll of paints, such as uh, surprisingly yellow ochre, even though it's uh, pretty, it shouldn't be that complex. And they say usually uh, there is not much difference in color with gambling, but it just looks nicer in mixtures. Um, I also use uh, genuine alizarin crimson by natural pigments and i do not like uh alizarin crimson hue again because it looks different in mixtures it looks cooler um my favorite brand that i use outside of school is uh Semilier, a french paint that uh, french impressionists used actually uh, i do not use it for school projects because at school like from the technical viewpoint, we are taught to use uh, paints with linseed oil. And Senel here is based, uh, um, Senel here uh, has safflower oil. Safflower oil dries slower and it has a slightly different, um, slightly different consistency. So, but that's, that's just my personal preferences. Uh, I guess the only strong preference is uh, this 
led white by old Poland. And well, Senel here that I use for uh, for personal work outside of school. Just very nice pen. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, how do you achieve depth and luminosity in your oil paintings? Um, in general, uh, all light uh, and uh, atmosphere, atmospheric, atmospheric perspective. Basically, all uh, light and depth effects are achieved by. Oh, I know it's it's it may sound boring because we are getting back to drawing, but it's achieved by the correct value structure and correct value relationships. There is nothing. Um, there are no like secret techniques. If you want, uh, but I can share some some secret techniques. Um, luminosity is achieved by uh, layering, isolating lead white. Or uh, I also like for lights that are almost as bright as your brightest bright, but just a little bit dimmer. Uh, I like you adding um, a very chromatic colors, just a hint of a very chromatic color, like to make it almost white, but with a hint of yellow or pink or bluish. Uh, instead of adding gray or neutral. Um, and oftentimes it doesn't even matter what color you add, uh, just whatever looks good. The trick is to make it very, very light, almost white. And as far as depth is concerned, if you have something uh, very dark, you can, uh, instead of black, you can glaze it with... Uh, a more chromatic black, so to say. Uh, that's uh, a mixture of uh, transparent red, blue, and green. Uh, and they should they should be transparent and they should be dark enough. Uh, for example, alizarin ultra and uh, phthalo green. And if you use that instead of black and apply it in layers, in glazes, uh, that creates very deep and interesting uh, black that, by the way, doesn't sink in. So those are two technical tips, but other than that, it's just drawing. Um, when I'm doing a study in graphite, I find it hard to translate what I see to the nine value scale. It's just too much uh, visual information. Whereas when I'm, I'm doing it from a picture, it comes out pretty good. How can I improve this? Uh, by going uh, drawing from a picture, do you mean... Uh, a photo or someone else's drawing because if it's someone else's drawing it's easier because someone has already translated whatever they were seeing um, into the value range of graphite even if it's from a photo it's still easier because the three-dimensional object or scene or whatever is in the photo is already translated into a flat uh, flat image. Um, as for when you draw what you see uh, yourself, the main problem is that first of all you see you see it differently because it's three-dimensional and you need to to draw a flat flat scene. And the other difficulty is that what you see has a much wider value range than what you can do in pencil. Uh, the solution is to start with your extremes, uh, white or whatever your uh, lightest light is. Uh, I assume it's the white of the paper. And your nine, that is as dark as your pencil would go. 
and then draw everything in between following pretty much the bark method, but you can simplify it a little bit. I usually go from uh, first from the extremes and then from the middle. Um, I find the value for the darker half tones, not necessarily everything, but at least something, and then I go from there. Um, so basically it's the same uh, it's the same methodology that we use for uh, that we use for bark. Uh, so just be very, very conscious about it. So oftentimes people have trouble uh, with drawing in, in graphite because they make everything too light and basically use the middle of the of the range. So consciously starting with extremes uh, prevents you from making this mistake. Uh, that's that's one remedy. And the other remedy is to just draw more. See, my answer to pretty much every question is draw more. <laughs> uh, how do you balance the technical aspects of classical training with your personal artistic expression? Um, I am glad that I have a uh, technical classical training because that's what allows me to express myself. It's a tool that uh, that I can use to get my message across and say whatever I'm trying to say. Without it, it would have been, if not impossible, then much, much more difficult. So it's not a question of balance, it's a question of how I can use this tool to uh, say whatever I'm trying to say. Clove oil. Clove oil is non-drying. Um, the do not put clove oil in paints. Do not add it to whatever goes on <clears throat> on the canvas. Uh, the only way I use clove oil is to put a little bit of it on um, on a sponge or like a piece of rag and put it in the uh, in the um, box. Or do I have a box? No, I don't have a box. But uh, the uh, um, the box where you put your paints uh, under uh, after the painting session, and then you can put it in the freezer. And clove oil prevents them like this. Uh, even that little amount of clove oil uh, prevents them from drying. It actually makes them dry slower. But do not put it in your painting because it doesn't dry. <clears throat> um, Old Holland Flake White or Kremnitz? Kremnitz. Uh, Kremnitz White. Um, <clears throat> How do you choose the themes for your paintings and what inspires your selection? Uh, there is no one specific specific algorithm. Um, sometimes it's uh, in uh, uh, Sonia Masaya. I thank you for a very interesting and the question, uh, very interesting. Well, by Sonia. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, back to the themes of the uh, of the paintings. Um, sometimes it's just an idea. Sometimes uh, I have the idea and I would do uh, studies and then in the process I would realize that no, it doesn't work and I would have to come up with something else. Um, the ideas come from all, all kinds of things, events, uh, people, books, um, just, yeah, uh, and then uh, I would just, <clears throat> and then I would think about the composition as abstract shapes and try to arrange objects that um, 
create a something harmonious visually and communicate communicate the idea but it 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 depends uh the uh, the still life i'm currently working on i think i made i made multiple studies for it and it started about a year before i actually started working on the on the scene and it looked very different from what it ended up looking now so just i read i think i experiment i like or don't like something and then see what happens um how many painters have you met that really use a grid to plan a composition do you yourself use them? If not, how do you know when a composition works? Is it intuitive? <clears throat> uh, speaking of composition, there will be a workshop in summer that I'm going to teach uh, that will be about composition. In two days during that workshop, we are going to be talking about composition. Uh, is it intuitive or not? How to come up with composition? How to do compositional studies? And so on and so forth. Uh, but as far as grid is concerned, I do not use grid because I guess I'm not patient enough. Uh, I just find it extremely boring and difficult and it's uh, uh i do know a couple of people who use grid um they usually use it not for composition but for drawing to figure out the drawing and they would usually paint from uh, from photos so for that matter i I can see how a grid can be useful, even though to me it's still boring and I still wouldn't be able to, to do it. Um, but as I said, it's not for composition, it's for drawing. Uh, if I understand you correctly. Uh, if you are talking about a uh, so-called armature, uh, that is when you divide the painting, the surface rather into thirds and then like diagonals and so on and so forth. Uh, I know that uh, Garrett using, uh, uses armature, uh, Garrett Vitanza, who is the head instructor at the Academy of Real Estate, uh, for to figure out composition. Uh, so I think he even, uh, he even has some examples of using armature in his Instagram, maybe. But again, during the workshop, we shall also talk about using different kinds of armatures. Uh, as far as intuition is concerned, and how do I know if the composition works? Um, is it intuitive? Yes and no. There are certain rules that uh, if you observe them, the composition usually works. Uh, and it's not just a rule of thirds, which you've probably all heard about. It's um, like different kinds of balance using diagonals, but balancing things mostly. And to some extent, yes, it is intuitive, but even the intuition is not based on some magical uh, talent that you are born with. It's based on experience and looking at as many paintings as possible. So I hope it answers your question. Thank you. Welcome. Um, do we do we have any more questions? Is that it? No more questions. <laughs> Thinking. <laughs> um, Um, I wonder if we mostly have people here from the online program uh, rather than in person. Just, just curious. I'm online. I have a well, I'm, put, I'm putting one in now. Uh -huh. I'm online as well. I'm oh. online too. Okay, so mostly Eric students.
what is your favorite pencil? My favorite pencil. Uh, at school, we are encouraged to use a specific brand of pencils that is uh, Stedler, uh, Lumograph, and it's, uh, it's usually 2B. My favorite pencil, however, is Iser Farber Castell uh, 6 here. Faber Castell 6B uh, for larger drawings and for <clears throat> yeah for larger drawings and for like something darker and faster. Or this is another favorite pencil of mine. This is a cheap mechanical pencil from uh, Big that I bought on Amazon. Uh, I think I have like a bunch of them, like 30 or 40 for something like $7, and it works nicely. Um, what are the books that have helped you the most in your artistic career? <clears throat> um, sorry, the wrong. Uh, there are books uh, that we have a list of recommended books on ARA website. And <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> my favorite one is, believe it or not, uh, Harold Speed, uh, the one about drawing. Um, I've read it three or four times, uh, Practice and Science of Drawing. Uh, some say that it's a little boring. I love it. And I feel like I've learned so much about drawing from that book. And I first read it uh, when I was working on my second bark. And I was like, wow, it clicks. And then I reread it, as I said, several times and everything um, like every time I would find something new and every time something would click. Um, that's, uh, that's book about uh, like the, one of the most influential books about art. Um, I have a book that, uh, there is a book that I always have uh, on my table and I uh, look at it uh, when I sketch. It's this one, uh, it's, uh, well, you know Wyatt. Uh, he was a wonderful painter, draftsman. Uh, he used watercolor, tempera oil, <clears throat> everything. And he is great. Uh, this is a book of his sketches. Uh, they are colored, but mostly they look like tonal. Uh, strong contrast, nice composition, mostly gray, uh, black, and white. And this is just something that I, I always have near me, and I constantly look at the, uh, at the images. And there are also books that have nothing to do with art. Uh, you can see I have a bookcase behind me. Uh, these are mostly... Uh, Mostly classical literature with some philosophy. Uh, um, so just just reading a lot uh, helps me as well. Um, any video to learn color theory and color mixing? Uh, Julie has Julie Beck, uh, who is uh, the assistant director at the Academy of Realist Art, uh, has a lot of videos on her Instagram, and she also has a YouTube channel. And she has uh, pretty good instruction videos about, including uh, the ones about color mixing. Uh, she also <coughs> teaches... Uh, a workshop on color theory and color mixing that is called Color Bootcamp, if I'm not mistaken. She usually does it in person, but uh, she might have some materials for that workshop mm -hmm. online. 
Well, I won't be able to stick it in the corner. Mm -hmm. cool. Just um, where I don't want that rectangle. Okay. okay, okay. Oh, problem. Sorry. You know what I mean? Okay. I thought this one was good. Look at. Uh. Okay. Sorry. Let's. Okay. Back to the chat. Uh, how do you price your work? Mm. Depends. There are uh, there are formulas where you basically uh, multiply the surface of the work, uh, the the size of the work in square inches, by a certain coefficient, depending on the complexity of your work and uh, your medium. Uh, graphite pencil obviously being uh, the least expensive and uh, highly rendered oil, uh, oil painting being the most expensive. Uh, you also add the cost of your materials and if you are selling through the gallery, you also consider uh, the commission that the gallery takes. So that gives you a formula and then you just uh, calculate. Uh, this formula, however, does not factor in your level of experience and your history of sales uh, in galleries or otherwise. If you are a painter who has a history of selling uh, their paintings for, I don't know, $10,000, then it probably wouldn't make sense for you to use that formula and sell something for less than that amount. If you are a beginner, maybe you would price your work a little bit uh, lower than someone who has um, more of a track record. Um, another problem with this formula is that if you have a small um, but uh, nicely rendered oil painting, it can uh, it can give you the price that is too low. So I would say that it's a balance of all these um, all these factors. But also think about um, about another aspect. Uh, think how much time and effort you've put into your work. <clears throat> Maybe it's not a good idea to base it solely uh, to base the price solely on time, especially if your painting is uh, like your painting process is not very efficient and you're still learning. But uh, if you spend, I don't know, even ten hours on an alla prima painting, uh, you probably wouldn't want to sell it for a hundred dollars. <laughs> you would probably want to <clears throat> make make more. Besides, the time and effort that you've spent for your training also counts. Um, basically, there is no one way. Uh, there are formulas, and uh, based on the size, you can find it online, but then there are other factors as well. And don't forget to add your materials, cost of frame, and the commission of the gallery. Um, I'm always interested in how different artists maintain the shape of the brush stroke and maintain the intensity of a color on their brush when painting over wet paint, other than paint, uh, uh, waiting for the first layer to dry. Any thoughts in addition to touch, angle of a brush, uh, viscosity of the paint, thinness, or, uh, and so on, thanks. Um, well, yes, the way how you apply paint does matter. Uh, the intensity of color is, I do not paint a lot of La Prima. Um, I think we are going to have questions, uh, ask me anything session with uh, Antonio Lones, who is our uh, La Prima expert. He does a lot of La Primas. I uh, not so much, I do sometimes. Um, the intensity of a color 
in my case, is achieved by making sure you do not, like making sure that you wipe your brush after each color, that you're not mixing uh, on the brush and you are not contaminating different colors on your palette. Um, also keeping your colors clean and like the ones that you have on top of your palettes, like clean colors, make sure that even if you put the brush into that uh, out of the tube color, make sure you still have the area of a pile, if you will, that is not contaminated by, uh, by other colors. So that's how you do not create mud, basically. Um, and as for the touch, uh, angle of brush, uh, I cannot, I wish I, I wish I could give you a specific angle, uh, like 45 degrees or something, but it has more to do with the like, feeling it. It should be pretty light. And in my case, I noticed that um, it should be like the amount of strokes should be very limited, preferably just one. Like, you make one movement and that's it. Like you do not do like, this because otherwise you're blending on the uh, on the canvas. Viscosity of paint. Um, if your layer underneath is more viscous, it definitely makes things a little easier. I do not add anything else to any medium to increase the viscosity of paint, but if I have a chance to use uh, slow, uh, faster drying pigments, uh, such as um, earth pigments and lead white, that's definitely a benefit. So I, I hope it answers your question. The main main things are wiping your brush often and do not like, making separate separate strokes and basically wiping it off after almost after each stroke. Um, what strategies have you found effective for marketing your artwork? Um, uh, the artist named Julie Beck. Yes, uh, Julie Beck. She is uh, she is an instructor and um, um, assistant director of the Academy of Realist Art. And you can find the name on the website. She is also on Instagram and um, on the website and students only page. Uh, on the students only page, we have links to your videos. Uh, as far as marketing, my work is concerned. Um, if I had an effective strategy for marketing my work and selling consistently, I would have probably been in a better place financially. Um, but I cannot point to anything specific that, uh, that works. I feel like I've been more successful with selling to people I have at least some kind of connection with. Um, so selling at open studios or um, local, small local galleries where there are openings and you can talk to people or uh, word of mouth, uh, anything that can, where you can meet your potential buyers and have some kind of connection. I also know that my personal collection of work, uh, albeit very small, consists of pieces where uh, that I got from the artists I know, and I know the story behind uh, behind the artwork. Uh, so for me, it's uh, it's important. So if you do not have any uh, any experience or very limited experience uh, selling your work and you're just starting, I would recommend starting with your local uh, or whatever is closest to you, open studios or um, 
something something similar to it. It's definitely uh most of them look like uh they have this country fair vibe. <laughs> And it's probably not something that I would recommend to a serious professional artist that is trying to uh, sell like larger, more expensive pieces. But if you have something small, that can be a place to start. Uh, they're usually fun. So even if you do not sell anything, at least you meet other people and artists in your community. Just not bad. Uh, what is your favorite paper? And do you have a sketchbook? Uh, do you take it with you and where? Um, favorite paper? Um, I have uh, I have paper for serious drawings and I have sketch paper, sketching paper. Uh, the paper for serious drawings depends on what medium I use. Uh, I like I like watercolor paper um, cold pressed. I like tinting it with uh, preferably with something with something exotic. I've tried. Uh, apart from the obvious watercolor ink and so on, I've tried Russian sauce, I've tried tea, I've tried coffee, uh, other things. But that's for like serious work. Uh, as for sketching, I like cheap paper. I do not like sketchbooks because they intimidate me and they make me feel like they are so perfect, so they should be filled with something something nice. And sketching is not always about creating something nice, so I do not like sketchbooks. I use just piles of um, cheap paper that I buy on Amazon that I do not feel precious about. Uh, and I either sketch on I don't know, something like, like this. Okay, I have sketches like everywhere. Um, and this is a more civilized version. A less civilized version is large pieces of paper, uh, 18 by 24 inches, that I also have like lying around everywhere. And I just sketch on them till I run out of space. And if I like something, I cut it out. If not, they just go to recycle. Then, yeah. Uh, uh, you're welcome. I uh, I did. I, I do hope that uh, some of my answers uh, are useful and that gives you some kind of useful information or at least some food and salt. Uh, as for take, uh, or taking the sketch, yes, I, I have sketchbooks that I take with me uh, when I travel just because it's more, it's more convenient. Uh, so I would have something small, something like Oh, something like this to sketch uh, on a plane, for example, when I go somewhere. Um, I hope it answers your question about, yes. about paper. So nothing, nothing fancy. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, anything else? Uh, do you go to local sketch groups? I wish, and I uh, I really want to do it uh, this summer. Uh, during the school year, however, I I simply do not have time to go to sketch groups. I I I am usually at the school five days a week, and then I have another day uh, is for my um, for my private students. And then on Sunday, I do not go to sketching events. I just sleep and eat. Uh, thinking back, if you had to do some things differently when you were a beginning student, what would that be? Uh, what tips would you give to a new student at ARA? Um,
I don't think I would have done something differently. Uh, not only because, uh, and I'm not saying that I did everything right from the very beginning. <laughs> Uh, it's mostly because when I was a beginner student, I did not have, I probably didn't have the ability to do something different. Like I can say, I wish I, um, I didn't take that much time working on my projects, but I did not have the ability to, to complete projects faster, for example, or I wish I had been, I had started painting sooner, but then again, uh, without, improving my drawing skills, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So things are based on each other. And it's uh, it's a slow progress. Uh, and you just, you cannot take out any of the steps, at least in, uh, in my case. Uh, what tips would you give to a new student uh, at ARA? Uh, again, draw more. <laughs> Uh, draw as much as you can and draw trying to apply the techniques that you learn at uh, ARA. Like you've learned, I don't know, division between light and shadow. Okay, do no time sketches. You've learned big form modeling. Uh, start doing simple uh, value sketches where you model form very, uh, like very simply and so on and so forth. Uh, if you have time to paint, then wonderful. You do not have to wait till you uh, complete the drawing part of the program to start painting. Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually glad that I started doing at least some value studies when I was still um, in the drawing stage. I was lucky enough to listen to Julie's lectures when she was having one of her uh, color boot camps, if I'm not mistaken, and I just happened to be at the school late, and she invited me to listen to a lecture, and that inspired me to start painting on my own and be at least to some extent prepared to what I had to do later in the program. Uh, but if you cannot, and if you do not have the setup uh, at home, then just draw. Also, I've noticed that uh, people who go through the program uh, understand the value of painting and drawing from life. If you do not have a chance to draw or paint from life at home, then use the photos. I know it's not the same, but it's still better than uh, not drawing and painting at all. So do not... Uh, do not be paralyzed by the thought that you need to do this complex setup, just draw or paint something. Uh, that's that's pretty much what I would recommend to anyone. Uh, what brush would you use with charcoal for blending? Uh, fan uh, badger, fan brush by, if I'm not mistaken, Raphael. And I think that's pretty much the same brushes everyone else uh, uses at school. But I do not, I do not blend charcoal with a brush. I, I personally uh, use the brush to distribute the charcoal and get it into the texture of the paper, but. Finishing and blending happens by um, like rendering with your hand and the very um, sharp tip of charcoal, basically filling in the holes, patching. I do not blend with a brush. I think that brush you can't you can't control it. But for distributing the initial layer, um, badger fan brush by Rafael. If you are Eric's students, he probably has recommendations and he uh, he can tell you where you can get one. Um, okay, uh, you're welcome. Uh, any any more questions? Uh, you're welcome. I'm 
I'm glad to meet, even though virtually, uh, so many people from the program that I've never met before, because online is kind of separate from in person, and they didn't realize that there are so many, so many people who do this program online, and. I, I I must say that I respect you all and I admire your persistence and your discipline because doing it online is so much more difficult than uh, doing it in person. I remember when we had uh, online lessons during COVID, I, I didn't like it and it was very difficult. So you are, you're great. Um, okay, I'm glad it was helpful, and then I'll see you next month, I guess, at our next uh, Ask Me Anything session, which is going to be, I don't remember, I suppose Gerrit or with Antonio, but stay tuned and uh, have a nice rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. And thanks a lot.